Okay, great to end the day on YouTube. Feels perfect. Really feels like just the perfect culmination of everything we've talked about today with streamers and big tech and TV and all the different voices and, and faces and people and companies that are crowded into the room here when it comes to rights. Um, John, let's start this way. You have a great story. I mean, growing up in, in Guam mm -hmm. and watching like NFL games from a very young age at crazy hours. Yeah, at, uh, in Guam, because of the times, time difference, you watch the early NFL window at 3 a.m. on a Monday. So that was my on-ramp to, uh, to, that was my experience across most uh, domestic sports, NFL, NBA, baseball, et cetera, which made for, you know, complicated school attendance when Monday Night Football is on at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday, but we, uh, we largely made it work. And I think I was mentioning to you in the back, we actually launched Sunday Ticket in Guam this year. So, uh, you know, there's a small but passionate cohort of fans uh, like myself will be able to tap into it. We will definitely talk about the NFL and about Sunday Ticket. Um, but let's just stick with kind of your story for a second. You have been at YouTube a long, long time. Yes. I think 16 years. Wow. It's uh, <laughs> insane to say that out loud, but yeah. So, you know, sports was not always necessarily the focus. I mean, what has the strategy been like to witness? Uh, obviously, that was before there was a YouTube TV, mm -hmm. which has really taken off. But um, in what ways have you guys made sports a, a major driver moving forward? Yeah, so going back, I mean, sports has always had a presence on YouTube. Um, I started working on our sports business in about 2012. And at that point, you know, if you were a fan of the NBA, you knew the NBA had an amazing channel. If you were a fan of the WWE, they had a great channel, but it was very hard to understand how everything fit. And if you were a fan, what role YouTube should be playing. If you're an advertiser, why you should consider spending dollars that could go to a live broadcast on YouTube. And even to our partners, it was hard for them to wrap their heads around exactly where we fit in their broader distribution ecosystem. Were we digital, were we video, were we social, et cetera. And so what we did is looking at the resourcing we had at the time, we very much focused on coverage, on content coverage, and this is still a theme that's important for the business today. And by that, what I mean is we wanted, we essentially made a list of the top sports in top markets that we wanted to make sure we had highlight coverage of. We looked at that list and we had about 40% of those properties active. So we spent years actually bringing some of those leagues and broadcasters onto the platform, but not only bringing them on, helping them understand the nuances of YouTube, what our audiences expected, and then ultimately helping them build a business on top of, on top of our platform. You know, when I first started having these conversations, you know, digital was promotion, it was reach, it was, uh, you know, largely viewed through that lens and now it's you know this is a legitimate PL and there are both reach and revenue expectations for the people who manage digital businesses I mean, i'm sure many of you uh, as many of you in this room do oh i'm glad you motioned to the crowd there i wanted to ask everyone who in the room has youtube tv oh yes yeah. pretty good coverage we we appreciate uh the patronage a lot of hands going up and uh there's a lot going on with sports content on youtube separate from youtube tv you know my interest i'm also a subscriber my interest in some ways is youtube tv and and watching other channels live on youtube tv but uh you guys have seen incredible growth of just sports related content especially as it relates to from creators on youtube main as you <laughs> yes. call it yeah that's right so we just released uh, a number of stats. I won't kind of bore you with each one of them. Bore us, bore the, us. The one that, there's a couple that stick out to me. We, over the past year, have done about 35 billion hours of sports, uh, of, of sports watch time on YouTube, not including the, all the live sports on YouTube TV. So that's your kind of primarily your VOD experience. And we're actually growing, sports content is growing at a 30% rate off of a quite large base on connected TVs. So yes, you know, you and I are both watching live sports on YouTube TV or watching live sports, you know, where we do, but we're coming to YouTube after that to watch press conferences or to get ready for a game. The, the one of the really unique things that I think the platform does well is because we have YouTube TV and because we have the YouTube main app, we're able to offer, we're able to meet consumers where they are. So if you're a 15 year old kid and you want to watch the NFL via shorts, you can do that. If you are a crazed Jets fan and you want to watch a 30-minute, you know, 30-minute docu-series of Jets training camp, you can do that on their channel. So we really provide by providing users those options and really investing in a really easy-to-use product experience. I think that marriage of our technology and product work and the great content that our partners bring um, has uh, been really important to our growth as a platform overall. 
When we talk specifically about sports content on YouTube by creators, and in many cases this is on YouTube Shorts, something we use at FOS, I mean, who's driving this? Is it people under a certain age demographic? Is it, I know in YouTube's case, writ large, non-sports only, it's gaming is so huge uh, on YouTube. But what, what are the people who are kind of eating up all the video time on YouTube? Yeah, so I think there are a number of sports creators that are successful, a number of types, if you will. And I actually think the definition of sports creator is changing. And so, you know, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a few examples. He obviously you know, has a, a great partnership with Disney, sells content on YouTube. Pat McAfee largely started as a sports creator streaming daily on YouTube. You know, Shannon Sharp has been on a rocket ship ride with his podcast and everything else that he's doing, but even he's been a more recent addition where he's really leaning into the platform. And if you look at what they're doing, yes, it feels like sports media, but a lot of that playbook or a lot of the executions are very similar to the executions that our most popular and effective creators um, execute. And what I mean by that is they lean in to the specifics of their personality and they really look to build a relationship with their audience, mm. right? And I think by figuring out where their lane is and how they wanna talk to their fans, I think that has been you know, a big key to their success. So there are those folks who are coming over. And then my favorite category of creators to talk about are we, we've kind of been cultivating this group of football nerds uh, is what I'll, I'll call them uh, lovingly. So we have creators, and some of them we work with uh, on this as part of this effort, who are doing long-form storytelling, strategy breakdowns of NFL games. They're going further than just, you know, how did Aaron Rodgers do last night? They're breaking down the coverages that, you know, the Niners defensive coordinator was throwing at him. And because of our partnership with the NFL, they're actually able to use all 22 and official footage as part of that execution. So you're seeing this kind of mesh, if you meshing, if you will, of the creator ecosystem with, that had largely been on the periphery and some of this official content and media. I think we're, we're seeing this across a number of areas VOD and shorts are one of them, long form content in the living room, and we're also seeing this in live as well. Yeah, you mentioned Pat McAfee, I mean, just one of so many examples. Uh, we wrote a story on the incredible speed at which Ronaldo got some millions of subscribers on his YouTube page. And, you know, it starts to seem like I love talking about this stuff, you know, kind of the new playbook for what current and former athletes need to do, and the <laughs> idea that each of them is a brand. And it starts to look like the dream, or not even a dream, but a need for every big athlete is, you better have your YouTube channel. Yeah, I, that, is, uh, that, is, that is the aspiration. But I think, for, I, I think obviously Ronaldo has done an amazing job and has, you know, his sub numbers have kind of just been off the charts and, you know, and faster than I think even we thought he, you know, they'd be able to run him up. But I think the key is for each athlete figuring out what they want to display. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you come to YouTube and what the audience expects is authenticity. It's not enough for me to just watch you on the field. I wanna know you, I wanna understand how you go through your day. That's not always the most comfortable um, for everyone, but figuring out exactly how you kind of wanna portray yourself and kind of, you know, how you wanna offer up incremental value to your fans is, is key, right? I think, you know, look at look no further than Tom Brady who recently launched a YouTube channel. He's doing longer form vlogs. There's, you know, which is great. You gotta get to see him work out. You kinda get to see him, you know, spend time with his friends and family. There's no shortage of Tom Brady content out there, especially now that he's, you know, broadcasting NFL games, but he's kind of carved out this lane in a long form, you know, through a long form format that allows even, you know, his, um, you know, most uh, loyal fans who have followed him throughout his career to kind of have a different, um, you know, experience with the content that he's posting on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we started our conversation with Mark Lazarus from NBC this morning talking about Olympics and how big the Olympics was for NBC. But also the Olympics were huge for you guys, for, for YouTube. You sent me some stats here. 40 billion minutes streamed. And then uh, in July, YouTube was uh, number one for total TV usage by a media company. First time a streamer was number one on that metric. First time a streamer was more than 10%. So talk to me about that behavior. I mean, people are watching the Olympics on the main channel that they're on. In this case, it was NBC, or they're watching yep. on Peacock. And then what is it they're consuming on YouTube after the fact? Yeah, so I'm really proud of how our team, not only domestically, but internationally, rolled out the Olympics. I think it's really emblematic of this kind of multi-format strategy that we talk to a lot of our partners about that. And what I mean is, 
if you're in the US, you're watching, obviously, subscribe to YouTube TV, as many uh, of you in the room are, are watching via NBC. Obviously, Peacock had extended coverage as well. But if you came to YouTube, NBC was doing a great job of posting highlights. The IOC had other content. We actually partnered with NBC and a number of other broadcasters alongside the IOC to bring our creators to Paris to be able to capture you know, the look and feel of the events from the ground and to provide a different discovery angle for this content. So when you, you, know, combine piece, you know, when you combine live content, you know, obviously all the action that the amazing athletes were able to deliver on the track, pool, court, et cetera, you combine that with the ease of opportunity to get caught up by watching, you know, maybe you couldn't watch, you know, US and Serbia basketball live, but if there's an eight minute recap right after that, it, you know, it's very easy to kind of, you know, be a fan. And then for younger fans, there's an on-ramp to the Olympics. Maybe they're not interested in sports at all, but they're interested in a creator who's on the ground at the event. And look, it, it'll take some time to build that relationship, but without that creator touch point, maybe, you know, you don't get Jane Smith in San Jose, California, because she's just gonna watch something else or kind of, you know, um, engage with content that, you know, she actually feel that she actually feels more of a connection to. Hmm. Well, so number one for minutes watch among a media company in July, big month in July, and that was without the NFL. And now here we are, we've got a new NFL season. Uh, for those who don't remember this drama, big story in the sports media world, was in 2022 when YouTube came in and, and uh, bought the package for, for Sunday Ticket uh, and DirecTV bowed out. It was kind of a, a little bit of a reported bidding war between other tech giants. Apple was in the mix in that case. So here we are, we're in season two of the DirecTV, of the Sunday Ticket package being available uh, through YouTube TV. How big of a boon and a boost has that been for you guys? Yeah, I think it's it's been a really important pillar for our overall, as you mentioned, you know, glad that uh, you ran them off so I didn't have to run off all of the connected TV stats. I, you know, it's no, it'll be no surprise to anyone who's, you know, attending an event like this that live sports content are driving a lot of consumption in the living room, period, and the NFL drives most of that consumption. You know, you can uh, look up the numbers yourself if you don't believe me. And when we were looking at Sunday Ticket, I think one of the things we were very focused on it was the fan experience. Obviously, this everything I said about the Olympics from an ancillary content standpoint is you know true and then some for our, our partnership with the NFL. The NFL had been on YouTube for a decade, kind of building up a, a massive fan base. We saw that within the YouTube TV ecosystem, live sports and the NFL were you know an anchor you know an anchor tenant if you will so the thinking is by bringing in Sunday ticket we know that we've you know spent years building up this very active engaged fan base by bringing Sunday ticket to the platform you now had the opportunity to in the US offer the most comprehensive NFL offering of any distributor. So that was very exciting to us. We thought it was a win for fans because in a world where, you know, sports content can be hard to find, we thought we were making things easier. We were also excited about the, our ability to innovate around the product. Obviously, we launched our, our multi-view product last year that was you know, pretty um, well-received. We've actually improved it this year. If you haven't tried it, you're, able, you're actually able to build your own multi-views this year. And you know, there's a whole host of other things that we have in the coming year. So kind of the combination of tapping into an audience that we built you know, already was exciting to us. And then really giving our talented engineers, product designers, and product, and product managers the opportunity to really rethink the way live sports should be delivered kind of made that overall you know, program attractive to us. You told me that in, in some ways, you know, YouTube getting Sunday ticket, people look at that and think, okay, now we're off to the races. This is the start of something. You're gonna see YouTube go for more packages like this, but really it's the inverse. W what do you mean by that? Yeah, so in the conversation we were having on, on this topic, everybody assumed, and I think you know, this, there was a lot of things written about this, YouTube's got Sunday ticket, they're gonna go after, you know, they're gonna work with the NFL and creators, they're gonna go out and get all this other ancillary content and build this ecosystem. And it was really the inverse. What gave us, as I said a second ago, what gave us the confidence to go out and get Sunday Ticket was the fact that we had been working on highlights for a decade at that point, was the fact that, you know, we had gotten a number of reps building up a large pay TV subscriber base via YouTube TV. And obviously we've engaged advertisers, you know, across both of those services. So it was, all of that pre-work that we did, that actually laid the foundation upon which Sunday Ticket sits, as opposed to the opposite, which is, oh, you've bought, you know, you've acquired the rights of Sunday Ticket, and then now you have to build all of these other pieces. I don't think that we would have been able to run as quickly um, if we did it the other way around. Mm. 
I mentioned there was a, a little bit of a big tech bidding war, or at least that was how um, my world framed it. You know, Apple was in the mix on that. Amazon, which now has Thursday Night Football. There were even whispers, you know, does Netflix want to get into that? Netflix this year has a couple live NFL games during the holiday season. I mean, how do you guys view those other tech giants competitively? I mean, the obvious difference, YouTube is a platform. You know, so it isn't necessarily the case that you'll be going after, uh, you know, you're, you're just distributing from others and, and it's about how they show up on YouTube. But when you view the different uh, tech voices in the room, how do you consider that, that arms race? Yeah, so I think we th primarily, quite honestly, primarily focus on what we're doing. There's enough wood for us to chop um, before you, you know, have to consider what's happening externally. But we're largely proponents of choice. I use all of those, I use all those services personally, but to answer your question more directly, um, the not to sidestep the, the original question, the thing that we really do is try and figure out what properties make sense for us to wrap our arms around where it's less interesting to just take a rights package that existed somewhere else and slap the YouTube play button on it and not really change anything. The NFL example is a great one because of the fact that we had, you know, all of the, all basically the balance through our media partners at, you know, ESPN, Paramount, NBC, et cetera, we had all those national games bringing that content, you know, bringing Sunday ticket made sense. But I'll give you another example um, from outside the US. I'll give you a couple, because I think there's some interesting ones there that are emblematic of this. During the Olympics, we partnered with Marca Claro, who is the uh, official rights holder throughout Spanish-speaking Latin America, so Mexico, Argentina, et cetera. They had limited shelf space on their channels. So what they did is they actually took the entirety of their Olympics offering and live streamed it on YouTube. And they were able to take advantage of multi-view, which we had developed for Sunday Ticket. They were able, we had we partnered with Claro to have creators on the ground in Paris. So that's an example of where you have, you know, a media company out there or a peer, like, hey, how can we work together to have, you know, one plus one equals three situation? So I think that's a good example of where we found something that was uniquely YouTube and kind of leaned into it. Then the other kind of, you know, staying outside the, the borders of the US for a second, we partner with a creator, uh, Kaze TV in Brazil. And what he does is he provides his own commentary over the World Cup, over the Olympics, UEFA Champions League, some Brazilian football, and it's largely simulcast, but he is able to bring in both a large audience, he's, you, know, you can look up the numbers uh, yourself, the, he has some of the largest live streams in YouTube's history, but also a very diversified audience. You know, two thirds of his audience is between the age of 13 to 34, which is very different from the audience that these same events are getting you know, through linear or through pay TV. So I think it's spots like that where we can use our technology, we can bring in our creators, and it can really feel like YouTube. I think those are the spots that we lean into, and as we think about the competitive space, if we do a good job of kind of tapping into kind of pillars like that, I think we'll be just fine as we uh, kind of you know navigate uh, you know the world of a, a very um, diversified uh, world of distribution. YouTube TV, I, we did this with uh, with Mark and Peacock. You know, you have however many millions of subscribers. I think what was the most recent number I saw? Uh, eight. Eight million. Eight million subscribers to YouTube TV. As you look at the next few years. What stands in the way? What are the hurdles for growing that number? What do you guys have to do? Yeah, obviously, consumer choice, um, I think, is the thing that we will continue to optimize for. We have to make sure that if you know, people are leaving other services or never had pay TV in the first place, that they understand the value, that the product is easy to use. I think you know, a lot of people thought we were crazy when we you know, were going to simply allow people to cancel at any time and not require contracts, et cetera, et cetera. But we really have put, attempted to put the user first and I think that has, of all the things that have made us successful, putting the user first and investing in the technology has been helpful because you know you can get these linear channels across a number of distributors or you know now directly from the media companies themselves. So when the content isn't necessarily the differentiating factor, it has to be the customer and the user experience. You know, going every managing everything from onboarding to how they find content or you know use their DVR on our platform. When we talk about choice and you know, the idea of YouTube as a platform for your live TV, a live TV alternate, uh, I have to ask you about this recent development with Venue and you know, Fubo being a, a direct competitor of yours, you know, that's a different place that you could get your pay TV. Fubo went after this uh, sports pay TV bundle that was an offering from Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers Discovery. For now, no Venue because Fubo won this injunction. Obviously, I imagine you guys were watching this pretty closely. Yeah, I, I think we're you know, generally, generally aware 
but with you know sun, with Sunday Ticket season two on the horizon, or as much as it was during the during the summer, you know we were just. Uh, our focus is largely on delivering the best customer experience possible. And if we do that, I think all of the other pieces will fall into place. You know, I think we're gonna you know, continue to see, as you, as you pointed out through many examples, the continued kind of slicing and dicing and evolution of content packages and distribution. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm excited for that evolution because it should be pro-consumer across the board, right? Giving people more choices, allowing them to buy the things or, or kind of invest in the services primarily that they care about. But as kind of, you know, we sit in our buildings, we're you know, still very focused on all the work that we have to do to ensure not only that we're continuing to innovate, but that the kind of promise of YouTube that you open up the app and that it'll work and that the content that you serve me will be relevant to me and that I'll discover new creators. There's so much that goes into that and that's really where we spend our time. We've been talking about partnerships with different leagues and also you know, a phrase you use is how they show up on YouTube. Um, if we can peel back the curtain a little bit and, and kind of see how these relationships work, you guys had an MLB network relationship mm -hmm. that you guys, you know, you parted ways with MLB network. You've still got NBA league pass that you can do through YouTube TV. DAZN, there's a relationship there. I remember writing about when DAZN launched. What kind of happens behind the scenes when we say, you know, this one doesn't make sense anymore in terms of being on YouTube TV, <laughs> this does. And again, as I said, it's not as simple as, you know, when we talk to some of these other guys, it's we're gonna go after live sports rights, the, you know, broadcasting those games on our platform. Yeah. So. Here's what I'll say, I think that, and it kind of ties back to the, the kind of content acquisition question you're asking. Because we have a pay TV service, because we now have primetime channels, which is our channel store product, because we have shorts, because we have the YouTube main app that's largely ad supported, we don't have to have so narrow of a view as it relates to live sports properties because if we're not aggressively pursuing a package and it ends up with our friends at Disney, great. We partner with them and those, you know, those games are available through, can be available through YouTube TV or DAZN's a good example where if they go out and acquire rights, you know, they won uh, rights to the NFL's Game Pass international product, we partner with them through primetime channels to deliver that in the markets where we're live. So our calculus is a little bit different because we partner with these media companies and it's less zero sum, mm. um, you know, than it, than it may be, than it may be elsewhere. Where, but really, to your point around platform, it, it is really something that we stand by. We have, and I, I've kind of seen this firsthand over you know, the uh, extended period I've been at YouTube, we are in better service of our partners. They're very smart, they're savvy, they understand their business better than we do by building these options. You know, we build YouTube TV, we build primetime channels, we build a healthy ads business. They'll, they are sharp enough and understand the alternatives and can figure out what makes most sense for them and where they should plug in and maybe where, you know, where they aren't as eager to plug in, at least right now. So we've tried to build business model variability in so that they're able to kind of choose the best way to monetize their content. And oh, by the way, you know, even the services that, you know, even like a Netflix is a good example of this. There are many services who aren't active through primetime channels or active through YouTube TV. They have large and vibrant followings on their VOD business because that, in a, you know, that's that first touch point. That's where you know users are going to kind of on ramp, and then they can, you know, they're smart enough to figure out how to then evolve that relationship or where it goes from there. So we kind of. We talk a lot internally, and it's a bit cliche about a kind of flywheel effect, if you will, that starts with the YouTube main app and then kind of flows through a lot of these other, a lot of these other platforms and business models. But in the same way that we talk about the importance of giving consumers choice, you know, we're, a, we're an open platform and we let our partners, you know, in, you know, obviously in discussion with them, figure out the right way, what content to bring to the platform and how they want to monetize that content. And in some ways, I mean, it's on them to grow their following. I mean, when we talk about YouTube and it being an open platform, it's like, you know, we can distribute and put you on the platform, but it's on the channel, league, individual athlete to put that work in to grow the following and the views. I mean. Yeah, it's an area that as an organization, we invest a lot of time and resourcing, right? So the, the way I think about it is, you know, and, and maybe this is some of the folks in this room who are, are in this situation right now, you are a digital media person at a league, broadcaster, et cetera, there's a lot of places you can spend your time. There's a lot of projects internally, there's a lot of you know, platforms tugging at your arm. So our teams, what they attempt to do is to figure out, okay, based on what League X or media company Y is looking to do, knowing that maybe you only have three, maybe you have three hours to spend on YouTube, working on YouTube each week, maybe you have 30, we will optimize for that 
and try and get you the highest return possible for the time that you invest in the platform. For some who you know want to go far, wide, and deep, that's going to be comprehensive live streaming of the Olympics and working with creators on the ground. For others, it's simply having a sound and effective highlight strategy that allows you to tap into this sports interest on platform and ensure that you know your sport is being discovered and that you're making it easy to follow. So it'll vary a bit, but it is frankly jo job one for our partnerships folks who are distributed globally is to ensure that leagues, media companies, et cetera, are able to reach their current fans on YouTube, but also kind of cultivating relationships with their future fans. Mm. As we kind of look into our crystal ball, which I love making everyone do, now, of course, the big rights are actually locked down now for, for a while, I mean, in terms of the biggest leagues. Uh, and we've talked about how that's, that's not really YouTube's game anyway. But when you look at the next five to 10 years, I mean, all we really know for sure, as you told me uh, in our chat a few days ago, is that sports content is gonna continue to anchor the living room. But when you look at that landscape with tech giants from your perspective, Google owned YouTube, all of big tech getting in on this, then there's TV. You know, it was interesting this morning, Mark Lazarus said, you know, the advantage that we still have over tech companies is the broadcast element, you know, and they don't have that. What do you see playing out? So I think there's, uh a lot in there. The thing that I, and I actually hit on it a few times here, the thing that I'll call out that I'm very bullish on and that we're very early on, and I think I'm gonna be right on this, is the integration of creator into live sports. Mm. From a broadcast and commentary standpoint, I think there we have we've barely scratched the surface there. You know, I think, you know, I'll kind of call on, you know, the Pat McAfee example again. The product that they're delivering on ESPN, I think it, it's great. You know, it looks strikingly similar to the product that Pat and his team were delivering on YouTube. And I think that this is a trend that we've seen for a long time. Consumers and fans care about the relationship they have with the personality. Like, they're not worried about production budget or, you know, paywall this or distribution platform that. As you kind of f have to fight for the next generation of fans, right, because that's the, you know, big uh, attractive piece of sports is that it aggregates audience, audiences, leagues, rights holders, media companies, et cetera, are gonna have to figure out how to tap in to new forms of talent who have these relationships and to figure out how to integrate them in ways that are organic to their platform, right? It's not just about bringing in Mr. Beast or the largest influencer you know and you know, um, you know, printing money off of that. You have to figure out how does this fit into our broader strategy and how do we bring in these personalities and creators in such a way that is, you know, that it's unique to us. And I think, you know, where ESPN does a great job of this with, uh, you know, Omaha Production and what they're doing with Manning Manny Cast. Cast is a great yeah, with, with Manning Cast. And I think, you know, they bring in guests and they kind of cr have created this parallel experience. And I think you're going to see more and more of that creeping in to the mainstream where the expectation will be that if I care, you know, if I want to hear NFL commentary from Brett Coleman, who's an up and coming, you know, football nerd on YouTube or strategist on YouTube, I'm going to be able to kind of choose that over, you know, maybe over Tony Romo and Jim Nance. And I think the forward-looking media companies, are, are many of them today already get that, and I think that will be more commonplace, especially, as you pointed out, as these rights are locked up for some time, they're gonna have to figure out how to keep it fresh, how to innovate, and how to keep these audiences flowing in. So, um, you know, my, uh, of, of all the things in the crystal ball, I think that's the one that I see the most, uh, most clearly. Let's end on this. You know, we, we started talking about some of the stats at the beginning of the growth of sports-related content on YouTube main and YouTube TV. Obviously, NFL Sunday ticket on YouTube TV is a huge draw. But of course, there's a ton of stuff on YouTube that isn't about sports. I mean, our interest today is sports. Um, I'm sure that one of your colleagues can go to a gaming conference and say, YouTube and gaming, it's so mm -hmm. big for us. Is sports the thing? Is sports the core number one engine that's gonna drive YouTube into the next few years? I think that creators will continue to be YouTube's backbone. And creators in sports, as, we've, you know, as I've kind of mentioned a ton of times today, are gonna be important. I think as we look at, from a ad broad advertising standpoint, yes, you know, partnering with sports properties is gonna continue to be important for us. But if we do a good job of engaging the creator community, as you pointed out, across gaming, across music, fashion, cooking, food, sports, et cetera, if we nail that, we will, main, we will provide ourselves with the opportunities to take big swings in media and big swings of sports. But that is still, you know, job zero for, you know, we're still, you know, job, the top priority for the teams that, um, that work every day on YouTube. Nice. Great stuff. Can we give John a round of applause? We'll leave it there with John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great stuff. Likewise.